So let's talk about individuality. That's what we're here to do. Oh boy. That's right. It's exciting. <laughs> I think that individuality is one of the more misunderstood concepts in our culture right now. Because at the same time, it's very ubiquitous. It's also kind of abstract. I think people hear individuality and they think, um, oh, you, you dye your hair blue or you do whatever you want. And it gets tainted with this hedonistic quality that is actually the opposite of what we're going to discuss, the kind of individuality that is more of a responsibility to yourself in terms of becoming yourself. I think of it in terms of like a block of marble and how a sculptor clears away the, the chaff, if you will, mm. and out of that comes form. That's like the journey to become an individual, is that you're kind of this undifferentiated block of human flesh. And as you go through life and become molded, and you let those parts of you that keep you formless fall away, you take form, you take shape, you become a defined individual. So I'd like to get very personal with our foray into individuality because it is one of the most personal things we experience. Mm -hmm. It is our experience and not in the kind of like my lived experience, <laughs> but a deeper way, a more intense way. So maybe we can start with what individuality means to us in terms of experience. What does it mean to you to be an individual? What does that word evoke to you? Well, <clears throat> so we're starting with the easy questions. Always. Right now. You know, as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, someone who has integrated as many aspects of themselves as possible. Um, I was thinking about we have this idea of what society is and what civilization is. And I often think of it as trying to, trying to shove this wild raging energy, fire, whatever, trying to capture it inside of this small container that we call civilization. Mm. So this wild raging fire is our humanity. And it's what we... You know, we put a suit and tie over it. We put all these sort of social strictures over it. We even paste a smile over it, over the top of it. But, you know, what are you, what are you going through in your own life? Maybe you've been devastated somehow in a, in a personal relationship. Um, maybe you have gotten a piece of really bad news. Maybe you're just in a, and you're, you're struggling somehow with some sort of, um, some sort of deviance. Mm. Uh, we want to keep it, uh, you know, lighthearted. But, <laughs> but then, you know, when you walk outside of your door, how much of that are you cutting off? Um, and how much of that must you sacrifice in order to be a part of a functioning society? And I think my thing is that as uh, an artist, um, I feel like there are more there are ever more and more forces encroaching on the artistic space, which should be a safe space for as free expression as possible. Um, there is a, a devaluation of what, I won't say a devaluation of it. I think there's just, there's a, there's a realm, an increasingly narrow realm within which you are able to um, express yourself. And um, for me, it's hard for me to answer your, your question in terms of like what it what it means to me or a personal experience. I think I think for me, I'm just somebody who has a, a, a huge store of empathy for other people, and so when I when I get a sense that other people um, are not being uh, valued as individuals, um, that that makes me upset. I'm thinking of um, specifically. I was doing a workshop in New York with uh, an actor who was from Utah. I think he's a former Mormon, and uh, you know he's. 
it's so funny. You know, he's this uh, six foot four, uh, you know, gorgeous strapping man, you know, but he's, you know, gay. And uh, he told this story about how in his town and where, where he's from in Utah, there were certain roles that he was just told he couldn't play. You know, you're too gay to play um, Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor and, and Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which is hilarious in and of itself. It's like, well, what is too gay for musical theater? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I'm already like, mm, <laughs> does not compute. How on earth is anyone <laughs> too gay to do you know, to play anything in a musical? But when he said that, I said, you know, I just... I, I, I it, it, it stirred something within me that I said, you know, I can't, um, I hate that there are people out there that, that feel that way about it, um, that they feel so strongly that they, that they would exclude this person and tell him that he can't be who, you know, who mm-hmm. he really is. And um, yet what I find now is that on the other side of that, uh, you, you really you can be who you are, but only in a, in a very, very, within a very narrow and rigid mm-hmm. uh, framework. And if you're talking about a sustainable career in arts and entertainment right now, we all know that there's a, there's a level of selling your soul in a way to kind of mm-hmm. conform and be like, hey, you have to be bright and shiny for like your feature in Vanity Fair mm-hmm. or something like that or, or for whatever promo work that you're doing on the Today Show um, with all those geniuses. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're talking about the nitty gritty of creating something that you're going to present to the public, um, it's my opinion that you need as wide a perspective, uh, wide um, an array of opinions and perspectives as possible. And right now it's only about quote unquote diversity in terms of this collective opinion of, uh, I guess what I'll call a progressive, some might call it a, a sort of woke doctrine. You have to adhere to that in order to maintain your career and advance your career, especially because it spills so much on uh, relationships and your mm-hmm. reputation. Yeah. Um, so nobody wants to go sort of out of line with that. But the problem is, if you're trying to to build a scene and you're trying to find these moments of that get down to the nitty gritty of what we are and who we are as individuals and as actors we we have this term called personalization mm. um, to get you know more to your theme um, you know it's if I'm playing Macduff in Macbeth and I, I I have to somehow approach and prepare this scene where I learned that my wife and my children have died, right? My preparation for that, it has, to, it has to say, how can I find within myself the experience of such great loss and such great depth? And these are the kinds of things that we don't normally explore in polite society. Mm-hmm. They're, just, they're far too volatile. They're, they're far too uh, um, personal. They're far too raw and, yeah, you and, don't and frankly embarrassing. Roll up to your office and say, hey, I'd like to talk about loss. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, my my child had, my child got his throat slit today and I just uh, Let's put that in an let's, Excel sheet. Let's uh, let's have a, have a meeting about it everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody does that. That's um, what art is for. And uh, you know, I often say it's funny because we talk, you know, people often equate acting with emotion and mm. it's like no, it's, they're just emoting. You know, mm. the ability to cry doesn't make you, you know, an, an actor. You're just indulging yourself in, in your feelings. The thing is people try not to cry and it's the heroic struggle mm. of them trying mm. to like maintain some kind of hold on that because their individuality is coming out because the 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 rawness of what's actually happening to them. Yes. You know, which is connected to the broader experiences of, you know, grief or jealousy or, you know, tragedy that link us all, you know, in, in the human experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that breaking that you are referring to of, like, stepping out of what we're allowed to express in polite society, right. which is shrinking. Right, right, right. And then the thing is, is that as artists, we're, we're supposed to stand apart from all of that. Yeah, that's we're a safe space. To, right, you know, like we don't really occupy safe spaces. It's one thing if you're doing maybe popular art. And I know mm-hmm. you have your opinions about popular art and entertainment. You and that's, that, that is made for the masses. I think there's a place for that. Um, you know, I'm somebody who's like, look, I'm, I'll, when I think about hip hop, for instance, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, all the heady, really rich musical stuff I, I love and I adore, but I'm also not above, you know, some booty shake and Meg the Stallion or something. You Absolutely know I mean? not. <laughs> like there's a place for that. But, um, you know, when you, 
<laughs> now I've gotten totally off track. I'm thinking about <laughs> like twerking. Yeah. You know, so let's everything. tie Meg Thee Stallion in with Macbeth. <laughs> but um, uh, by the way, there, there's a superstition where you can't say Macbeth. Um, Oop. It's supposed to be bad luck, but you know, it's, it's not a safe let's space. See where though, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but, but we're supposed to be people who who look at life and look at society and our civilization and, and the various structures or whatever, and you know, we're we serve as sort of a mirror to what we see, and that includes the the, the uglier stuff. So we have mm-hmm. to find a way to be more in tune. That's why so many artists are freaking crazy. Yes, <laughs> you know, exactly. because they they live in this realm of, you know, the unseen, the unknown, right. the unspeakable. There was an actress. I think it was might have been was it Sarah Bernhard, maybe. I forgot who it was, but she said she was talking about actors specifically. They have to be more human than humans. Mm, you know, you have to be in yeah. touch with all that, all that stuff. I love that because that's to me what you're touching on is this division, right, between polite society, everyday life, where we go about things, we hold the door open for strangers, we're polite, we keep it together throughout the day. But where do you release? all that mm. pain, all that grief, all that anger, all that fear, if not in art, whether you're creating or consuming it, having that cathartic experience through consuming art or through creating it. And so if we're shrinking that realm, we're shrinking what's allowed in the realm of art, we're shrinking the human experience, essentially, because now all these other things have that are not allowed in polite society and your everyday expression, well, they're no longer allowed in the realm of art either. And it doesn't get rid of them. It just suppresses. That's, I think, what is one of the problems with our culture now is this immature idea that to to censor, to ban, to make unspeakable is to erase, is to annihilate. It's not. It's to suppress, which has a cost because it comes out somewhere else. And so tying all of this to individuality, I like to look at the experience of the individual as one level and then society as another level. And these two are tied, right? Because society is comprised of individuals. So if you have a society of repressed individuals, you are going to have a repressed society. And so... If we're getting to this place where individuality is looked at as either some kind of Western luxury, something that we indulge in at the expense of others, or some kind of hedonism, or something offensive even that we see in the more uh, political arguments against it, where, well, actually, you're you're damaging the collective, and individuality comes at the expense of, of progress for the collective— then where does that take society? So I'd like to tie this part of our discussion into society as a whole. So what happens when we neglect individuality? What do we see in society when we have a population of people who are either too afraid to be themselves, which we come back to this cliche. This whole discussion is going to be a deep dive into what the hell it actually means to be yourself and whether that's important or whether it's just a useless cliche. So I think that we've seen many things in society recently that show us what happens when you neglect the importance of developing your individual existence, your individual identity in service of the collective instead, in service of conforming to whatever group you're you know, adjacent of. So what do you think about the relationship between us as individual people working to become more defined individuals and how that plays into society as a whole. I think the more that we stifle um, these individual impulses, and again, I think the danger is if it's obviously if it's too broad, then you have chaos, you have Mm -hmm. all kinds of problems that emerge from that. Um, So I suppose what we're talking about is the healthy expression of whatever our individual impulses is 
built on this idea as well that, um, and what I meant to say before is that um, when you have a, a more integrated person, it's like, yeah, you know, it's the good times and the happy things about that. I actually had a clown teacher who said, you know, as, as a... Did you say a clown teacher? A clown teacher, yeah, yeah, in my, <laughs> my conservatory class. Every, everyone should take clown for, for a year. I would love to do that because, because I not, think our clown world, everybody should be well-trained. Well here's, here's, well, here's the thing about clown, and it actually, it actually goes into our conversation. Because people think of clowns, they think of maybe, um, you know, depressed people who dress up and perform for children at birthday parties or something. Or they think of a bunch of uh, um, people piling into and out of some small vehicle at a circus. But there's really a, um, I'll give you an example. So one of the first things that we did in, in clown class, and that actually Amazing. is called clown class in this uh, master's program, um, we all got into a circle, and then one person got in the center of the circle. And the one directives was just to make us laugh. Mm. And until you're put in that situation where you have a bunch of people who are watching you, and the expectation is that this person is going to, they have to do something to make me laugh in order to win this game. And what you see is that a lot of people will jump to whatever kind of tricks work for them in life. You know, it could be, they'll go like, I'm going to do a weird voice, or I'm going to tell a, a funny joke or whatever. They have all these defense mechanisms up that work for them in other places. Um, but then what tends to happen is that to their horror, they look around themselves and realize that we're all like, this is not entertaining. It's not funny. Like, what are you doing? You're wasting my time. We're all getting older. <laughs> and um, and you're boring. Mm -hmm. And... What, what you began to see was that once people, once people's sort of defense mechanisms melted away and they were in, they actually were in the moment of like, oh my God, I'm in this circle and everyone sees I'm not, I'm not talented, I'm not funny, um, I, I'm not interesting, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm boring, there's, you know, nobody is paying attention to me, they're all laughing, they're laughing at me but not in the bad way, they yeah. feel bad for me. <laughs> Um, I wish the earth would just swallow me up. And so then you, be, you began to see the suffering begin. And that's when it got funny. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's when it, that's yeah. when it became, became, uh, started to get funny. Um, and part of it was because, you know, they, they were in the reality of the terror they were experiencing, the, the social death they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And once the reality of their suffering, you know, came alive and began to live in them, and it's a weird thing. Maybe it says something about our psychology as, as, as spectators then. then. Yeah. But maybe that, that's part of it as well. It's, it becomes relatable because our own terror, mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm glad it's not me. And when you see people actually embrace that like that terror and like, oh, this is so, so horrible. I mean, people would start like crying. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, one of the funniest, one of the funniest um, uh, experiences, and this, this is a famous actress now, so I'm not going to tell you who it is, <laughs> but she came in. She was having a hard time in, in the program. And we're all, you know, we're all doing our, our warm-ups and, uh, you know, we're all in a circle. She comes in late and um, we all look at her and we're all doing some like, absurd, like, you know, we're like doing duck noises or yeah. something <laughs> ridiculous like that. And we all look at her and the, the teacher just goes, uh, I'll, I'll have a fake name. The teacher just goes, hi, Crystal. And we all like look back and she just goes, And then she runs out of the room. Oh it was my God. hilarious. That's it was amazing. hilarious because it was so fast and like mm -hmm. so simple. And she was having a really rough time, but it was also really funny. Yeah. And I don't know quite what that means, but it's just, you know, it's just getting down to, to the truth of that experience. So you have to be in touch with, I, I guess maybe it's the duality, the, the balance between um, suffering and lightness, you know, mm -hmm, darkness mm -hmm. and light. The, the, the intermingling where we watch someone else. I mean, comedy is referred to as tragedy yeah. with timing, yeah. you know, but it, it, it was so incredible because over time you had to sort of learn how to strip away all of the nonsense, strip away yeah. the, 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 and you see like all the great clowns. Like there's an, an American named Bill Irwin. If mm. you go look him up, I mean, just brilliant stuff. His physicality is, is genius, but there's also a childlike openness mm. and, um, and it's it's the openness, I think. I think that's what it is. Right. I think so that's what it is. Getting back to your question is, if once you have a society that doesn't know how to deal exactly. with this sort of openness, then you have people who 
are divorced from themselves. And I think over the past couple of years, especially, when people are sort of told mm -hmm. deliberately to stay away from each other and to, and to, you know, cordon themselves off or cocoon themselves within, you know, their apartments or their homes mm -hmm. to, to not talk to other people unless it's, a, unless it's through this filtered artificial digital form. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, w once you cut off those sorts of chains of, of interaction, you know, you have problems there. But then you also, you know, I look at, um, for instance, school shootings that we have mm. in the United States. And almost without exception, each of these stories has to deal with some sort of person who was dealing with deep social alienation. Mm -hmm. And someone who didn't have, I think, a healthy way of channeling whatever their rage was, whatever their darkness was. They weren't in touch with that. They weren't comfortable with it. And then mm -hmm. so maybe the, the deeper question becomes, outside of in our quest to become individuals, you know, how do we navigate and negotiate the, the, the deeper, darker parts of ourselves? And I guess that's what philosophers and artists have been trying to grapple with um, in all kinds of novel ways. I mean, it's, it's the, the center of the human experience. You know, we, we've been trying to deal with that for centuries now. Yes. And we're still trying to work it out and we still yeah. keep screwing things up. You know? <laughs> well, we're making it harder, right? We're because now we're shrinking right. the circle that you can experiment with trying to express those dark experiences that we're going to have that are part of the human experience. When you set up this minefield where you're essentially in a fishbowl and you know that there's this class of people who are waiting, who have made it their purpose in life to find ways to interpret everything that you do or say in some malicious way that can then be used to disparage you and cast you out of, you know, the society as some kind of evil person, some kind of degenerate, some immoral person. How are you going to feel capable of exploring those darker sides of your experience. I mean, we're setting up uh, a system in which every impetus pushes you in the direction of suppression, of turning away from introspection and looking outside yourself for the indication of what's good, what's right, what should I do, what should I say? Because, well, if you follow the script, you know that you'll at least be spared public humiliation and disparaging another day. So I love the clown story so much. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think that that speaks to um, the importance of authenticity and genuine expression and vulnerability. Because vulnerability, yeah. like you said, when people first got into that circle and they tried to be funny. They turn to these devices that they used in everyday society to feign funniness. But it was not funny. It was this kind of facade of funny. And what was really funny was genuine experience, whether that be suffering or not. There's something about seeing a human be very human mm -hmm. that we immediately connect with. And I think that that ties into what you're talking about in terms of our society orchestrating customs that distance us from each other now. Social distancing, lockdowns, all of this is entrenching distance into our culture. Now it's becoming a system that actually in, in, it has this like encouragement of distance. It's like, it's better if you stay home. It's better if you don't visit your family. It's better if you carry out your conversation online, which is one of the least human places mm -hmm. to speak to other people through. And so I think that we're getting into a strange place where at the same time, our culture is very mediated by technology, which is very inhuman in some ways. Well, I was, you know, what I was going to say is that, you know, is it the price that we inevitably mm -hmm. have to pay for all the, the relative comfort and privilege and convenience that we enjoy because of all this technology and the availability of information? And, you know, you can silo yourself. I mean, even yeah. thinking about um, such a, a funny thing, I'm bringing this up, but even a hobby like gaming, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, now you can connect and play for hours and hours at a time. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be one of those guys now. I'm gonna be one of those guys. <laughs> but like back in my day, it was you know you went over to your buddy's house, yeah. you played some Nintendo or whatever. 
you you might have played for an hour, maybe two hours or whatever. Then you got bored and you went outside, mm -hmm. you know. And if you got bored being outside, then you'd come back in and play some more games or whatever. Or you or you didn't. Um, you know, you'd get dirty, you'd skin your knees, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd do all kinds of stuff. You were just, you know, uh, and but now you don't you don't have that. Co or even you know, I was thinking about this last night. Like I'm a big fan of like competitive gaming, like mm -hmm. fighting games specifically. And it's a it's an entirely big scene now. It's it's so amazing what they've built. Um, but it's an entirely different thing now where you can compete with somebody else online. Uh, but I came up in a generation where you also played in arcades. And so mm -hmm. you had the physical presence of the person that was next to you. Yeah. You know, you had to put your quarter on top of the machine, yeah. you know, to indicate that you had next. And the person <laughs> who, you know, the winner keeps staying, you know, stays on. And, you know, and so there's a whole kind of culture that becomes built there as well. But that, but even building a community in that way is not, it's not gone, it's just different now, but it's lacking that, um, that sort of communal, mm -hmm. visceral, um, in-person um, vitality, I guess. Uh, all these V words keep popping into my head <laughs> for some reason. Um, so I guess the broader point is, and even again, back in conservatory, I had you know, one of my um, speech teachers, you know, who's you know, taught at uh, Yale, Juilliard, and NYU, you know, she's seeing the best of the best, she is the best of the best. And she was like, you know, the more I see kids now, more and more generations now, they come in. One, and this was a, a concern shared by the faculty in general, was that they're seeing fewer and fewer people, fewer and fewer prospective students, fewer and fewer prospective professional artists mm. who are willing to kind of live in the cracks and um, be vulnerable in these ways. Um, but there is also like you know the the more we're we're wedded to these to these machines to, to this technology to the mm -hmm. digital realm the less able um our artists now our performers now are able to live at a certain at a certain capacity at a, with a certain level of vibration mm. you know we had this one exercise where we did greek messenger speeches now in in all these greek plays right all these greek tragedies there's always someone near the end who has this like two or three page monologue just describing some epic events that took place <laughs> off stage. And so you as an actor have to figure out how am I gonna come on stage with this much urgency, this much intensity, and this much filled with so much emotion to communicate to this uh, coliseum full of thousands of people, this, you know, the intensity of this experience. And it's like, well, now we're so small and now we're so digital yes. that people lack the musculature to even um, to even inhabit these these things and um, mm. and they, they lack the inner the inner force and 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 vitality to, to to inhabit these texts and we're more disconnected from each other now yeah. and so that's on top of all of the socio political things that we're talking mm -hmm. about um, and or that we're we're sort of touching on which create an environment where you know everything has to be sanitized yes. for everyone's protection. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and my alma mater, again, you know, conservatory now, you're not allowed to say, like, I went in, I mean, what inspired me to go in the first place was seeing this actor expressing his own creative individuality, yeah. right, in terms of, I saw him in an Oscar Wilde play, and he was like this, he was this sort of aristocratic, you know, uh, really um, almost dandyish character. Mm -hmm. But then I saw him play Michael Cassio in, uh, in, Othe in Shakespeare's Othello, and he was so down to earth and so gritty, and, um, you know, he has, Cassio has this monologue about his reputation once he's dismissed from uh, his post by Othello. And he's just devastated and heartbroken. And I looked in the program and said, oh, my God, this, this is the same guy. I can't believe that. I want to do what this guy does. Mm. And so I go, I go, I go off to, um, to conservatory. And first of all, it's kind of weird because I'm like, am I in the cult right now? It's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of, kind of bizarre. But I, um, I, I almost lost my train of thought because I, I thought I forgot about why I brought the story, uh, the story up. There's um, individuality, being in touch with the, the, human, the core, human experience, the ability to right, walk so, on stage as a messenger so and embody thing, right, that. Right. So, so, so part of it was. You know, so the, the reason that that was so amazing to watch this one actor was mm. that he transformed mm -hmm. into these different people. And then you meet him off stage and he's like, you know, he's himself. You yes. know? He's like, what's up, Gregory? And um, I said, I want to be able to do that. Mm. And so I went into this program 
where the idea was to become a transformational actor. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be a, a character actor, someone who can morph into different, um, you know, things, you know, and it makes you more hireable, to be honest yeah, with you, yeah. you know? And what, I, what I've heard now is that you cannot say, you cannot use the phrase transformational actor anymore because it will come off as offensive to certain sexual minorities. So this is, this is what we're shook. right. This is what we're dealing with right now. This is how pervasive uh, the pressure is, you know. And it's like, wait a second. That's fun for that. That's how you. That's how you. That's one way you serve the public. Is like it's yeah. fun for people to watch. I mean, you know, when I was coming up, you watched like Denzel Washington and Tom Hanks. They were different in every movie. That's what we want to go see actors well, do. Well, I'm losing my mind because first yeah. of all, if the word transformation becomes offensive. What does that speak to the values of a culture? Transformation is the goal of your life forever. Mm. You should always be transforming. You should always be changing, alive. That is to be alive. If you are mm. the same always, you are stagnant, you are dead. Now, of course, a culture that values control does not want transformation, does not want change, does not really want true life. Because mm -hmm. true life is unpredictable, spontaneous, just like good art. And so it's if- It's dangerous. Exactly, that's dangerous. Because we don't know what you're gonna say. We can't have that now. Yeah. So that that's again this ethos that's like prioritizing control and predictability above the risk that good art and genuine expression requires, you have to have that space for going a little bit out of bounds. I would say control and safety mm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to predictability. I mean, the, the, the predictability is a byproduct of yeah. the obsession with safety. Yeah, exactly. And that's what cannot be tolerated, you know, is the unpredictability of art. Good art is going to be slightly spontaneous. I think that you need to have that space to know that I can take a risk. I can do something slightly unexpected in my work because I need to see what that brings me. And maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's not the right instinct. Maybe right now in this conversation, I decide to cut you off and jump in, but it's because it resonates to me. In that moment, I feel I wanna grab onto that line and take it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't work, but maybe it does. And I have to have that space to be spontaneous enough, to keep enough unpredictability in this conversation to keep it interesting. Mm -hmm. Because if this conversation is completely predictable, if everybody listening knows what's gonna come next, what's gonna be said, knows every point, why are they watching? That becomes a kind of, you know, um, propaganda almost, like this the state TV where you turn on the news and you know what's going to be said. Everything is fine and we are all good. Smile and continue on with your day. That's the epitome of a society that v values predictability and control and safety. It's everything is expected. Well, There's you know, no room for life. I um, It also gets down to the question then of what is the what is the purpose of art and artists in, mm. in this sort of society? And I don't know why this popped into my head as you were speaking, but because the question then also becomes for me, well, why is a conversation like this even important? Mm -hmm. Why should anyone care mm -hmm. um, what these people are babbling about? And the answer I came up with was oddly enough, Van Gogh. Hmm. Because I said, you know, he could simply have painted, you know, like the chair you're sitting in right now. It's, it's I guess what's important is what we're talking about or, or what I'm trying to get at in terms of the importance of, of art and what it can mean. And this is partly a crisis of meaning, I think, that, mm -hmm. we're, that we're sort of spiraling towards in, in our conversation. But what does it mean to look at the chair you're sitting in now and then what does it mean for Van Gogh to interpret that chair mm -hmm. in a painting? And the sort of, you know, what is it that, that separated him from other people? You know, maybe other impressionists, um, you know, in painting a, a fence or a chair. It's like, you know, he could have just painted it in this one way, yeah. but he chose 
it's not just a, a, a turquoise chair or, or a teal chair or whatever. It's It's got turquoise and there's some blue in it and mm -hmm. some baby blue and maybe some flecks of purple and red and all kinds of things. And you can see, you know, when you look at his paintings, you see his individual brush strokes. He's, mm -hmm. not, he's not shy about showing you his brush strokes. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to create this photorealistic painting, you know. And then the question becomes, what do I derive? What do I experience while I'm looking at his painting of the skyline at night or, or the sun or his own self-portraits or whatever? And all these lines, all these shades, this particular palette. And then... Um, what kind of culture was he in that allowed him to dare to, you know, play with um, conventional artistic norms at the time in this in this sort of way? And frankly, it's also relative um, in terms of what I do as an actor too. What kind of what what are you, what intellectual and temperamental and emotional and psychological palette uh, uh, tools do you have? Colors do you have mm -hmm. in your palette to to create these characters and these moments and these scenes? And what you have is um, when you have a culture that that is continuing to constrict um, the colors in your palette. Constrict the colors in your palette. You know, it, it not only changes how the like you know how the rehearsal, which is the act of creation, really, or the act of creation is conducted, but it also, I think, determines how. Um, how artists engage with their material in the first place. Mm. But then the, the ultimate effect becomes a sort of wan, mm -hmm. bland, um, stale product that is sort of foisted on the public. I mean, it's happening right now with, uh, with uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, to use a popular example. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen the controversy around, no, around no. this show, but uh, you know, so Amazon has a new show. I'm canceled already, so I can talk about yeah, this exactly. and not be worried you're, about being a professional. But it's... Um, <laughs> It's 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 generating a lot of controversy because uh, you know it's it's huge like diverse casting or whatever mm -hmm. and all the people who don't like it are saying well it doesn't really honor Tolkien's mm. lore um, the writing is not good and the acting is wooden mm. um, it looks beautiful we can see the money on screen but even some of the CGI is not great but now what it's being presented as is look at all the racist backlash uh -huh. against this this uh, this show we're gonna hide reviews we're gonna do this and all that and so. You have this system now that's dominated by people, um, dominated by people who they they render like any internal criticism dangerous, yeah. and they also render any external criticism to be irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then, like, there's this you know this obsession with with control, but that's a oh, huge digression. It becomes back back to the question of like what is the what is the role of the artist now, and like maybe mm. and that that feeling that you get when. Or that I get at least when I see like a, a Monet painting, or mm. listen to, um, you know, Tchaikovsky or something, or or Duke Ellington or something like, or listen to Whitney Houston sing, or Pink Floyd, or Pink Floyd. Edit me out. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that one out. Put a little bleep you on that failed, one. But, failed, uh, failed, failed, failed. But like, so, the spontaneity yeah, what, what must continue on. <laughs> but see, but that's that's the thing. That's the danger, though, because you you your authentic self just came out just I know. now. I know because. You know? I feel for that art because I know right. what you're talking about. That exact experience of something that's so deeply human, so emotive, that it brings that out of you. And that's the point. That's why we value that art. That's why we have to allow that space for expression because then what happens to the other side of the equation? So we're getting bland art. When you're getting a bland populace. You're getting bland audiences. And to speak to your question of what is the role of the artist, in some ways I think the role of the artist right now is to model individuality for the population. Mm. I think to tie it back to this, this question of individuality, I think that it seems like a cliche, right? Be yourself. But at the same time, it's one of the most challenging things that people must do right now. Because as that circle of what's okay shrinks, be yourself becomes increasingly difficult. There's always the threat that yourself is going to be wrong. But or the, fascist. Yeah, exactly. Whatever the, <laughs> the insult of the day is. And the thing is that you just end up with that same problem of blandness. Everybody is this inauthentic, gray, sanitized, censored version of themselves. And there's no life behind it. And so we're all kind of 
wilting away behind these facades of okayness, acceptableness. And deep down, any person that actually still is somewhat connected to their humanity knows that that's sucking the life out of them. The only people that really thrive in an environment of hyper censorship and criticism are people that have lost touch with their own humanity or are so afraid mm. to touch it that they would rather condemn any expression of it around them so that they can feel okay being out of touch with their humanity. We look at our society and if it prioritizes control, safety, censorship, okayness, blandness at the expense of authenticity, then who wins in that situation? Who is it that thrives in that kind of an environment besides someone that has lost touch with their humanity that needs that kind of space to be authentic, that needs that space to sometimes curse on camera when they shouldn't have, all of that. And so that is, then, to me, the role of the artist. But then it becomes, it becomes so curious, though, because ostensibly you have this vocation, profession, whatever you want to call it, this field where people are attracted to it because of their, their openness, because of their creativity, their mm -hmm. imagination, um, and because of, you know, some sort of at least in their view, their connection to humanity. So then the question becomes, why is it then that our, our artistic and cultural entertainment uh, spheres are so dominated by, um, I can't say the word dominated today for some mm. reason, dominated, <laughs> dominated. Um, I should have done some more vocal warm-ups. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the problem, <laughs> there you go. Um, how is it then that we're that we're discussing um, the, the disconnection from humanity and the loss of this openness amongst people who are supposed to be as open um, and I guess mm. welcome, welcoming and as uh, non or unrigid or whatever as possible. I just, you know, that's, that's the big, that's the tough part for me because it, mm. undoubtedly they see themselves as, you know, being open and tolerant and um, dare I say progressive. I never use that term without quotation marks <laughs> yeah, nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's the big mystery for me is how do you, how do you square that circle? Or maybe, you know, maybe we're lo looking at it too rigidly in terms of, you know, m more than one thing can obviously be true, right? Mm. You have people who, who are complex and who can be open in some ways, but in other ways they're so, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it, ma it makes me think about... Um, in my training, we were taught that curiosity and empathy are two of the cornerstones for the craft of acting. Mm. And yet, when it comes to certain issues, you see people mm -hmm. completely unable to or unwilling to um, um, exercise either trait at all. Absolutely. And yet, they call them—they still call themselves artists. And I'm like, dude, you're cutting off an entire spectrum core, of humanity yeah. and thought and experience um, and understanding. Well, that's fear to me. I think that comes from fear. Mm -hmm. And that is what, something that ties into individuality on the, the personal level, right? It's that you need courage. You actually do need courage to be an individual. And right. whether that individual expression manifests in art or in some other realm, some other pursuit, you do need courage because it requires you stepping outside of the comfort of the group. You're putting yourself slightly at risk by stepping outside of the mold and going your own way. And that takes courage. And I think perhaps our culture has taken that for granted because we have this disembodied kind of individuality where our individuality is very aesthetic. It's, I dye my hair pink and I wear this kind of, you know, radical clothing and I have these radical but completely accepted among my peer group beliefs. There's nothing at stake there. Yeah. You need courage to be an individual or else it's merely this kind of, um, like, cosplay of individuality. And so we're not connecting the cost with the outcome. You need to 
have a cost. There has to be something at stake. And if there's no risk, then there's no real reward. And so I think that we've completely lost the concept of individuality on the personal level. And so you have art that suffers, right? You have people well, that won't go there. Well, question for you, just briefly. Are you, do you mean we as in, you know, Cultural. four-letter word, but collective, or do you mean just in the arts culture specifically? Both. I think Western culture. I think Western culture has lost the understanding of individuality. And I think it's something that um, follows this, this pattern that I keep seeing where we have these rewards but we've lived so long without having to actually pay the cost for them that we forgot that there's a cost for them. And so now we look at the cost, like free speech. You know, we've become so intolerant of speech we don't like that we don't realize you don't get to have free speech without the speech you don't like. Because then it's quite literally controlled speech. There's an allowed range of speech then. And so there's all these things where we only see the costs now and we don't realize they're connected to the reward. And I think individuality is one of those things that we have this kind of like disembodied abstract idea of individuality and no one's willing to pay the cost. No one's willing to feel the discomfort of being courageous in their work, their art, their life to be an individual. They don't want to face the criticism. They don't want to be, you know, uh, looked down upon by their peers or whatever it is. And so the cost in that case is the individuality. So you stay formless. You stay like that block of unchiseled marble. You stay hidden within the group of okayness, blandness. But I think that people are actually kind of wilting under that. And that's my final question that I would like to present to you and tie up with is, on that personal level, what, what can we do to pursue individuality and why 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 is it why should i face criticism for things that maybe feel somewhat right to me why should i put myself out there and do things knowing that i'm going to be disparaged as some evil fascist or whatever the insult of the day is why should i take those risks in my art and make things that might be terrible but feel right to me? Why should I pursue my own individuality as opposed to taking my cues from people that say they know best? Hmm. Well, I think for one, it certainly makes life more interesting. I think from the perspective of an artist and maybe someone who, I mean, part of my, my field is, is understanding people and observing life. And I think that having a situation where you have people who, I, I think the human race is so, even though it's united by a set of sort of universal um, needs that we all have, um, to eat, to procreate, these kinds of basic things. Um, we're so profoundly different and so interesting. And just the idea that all of these p different characters and traits and personas can coexist at the same time and things don't, you know, immediately break down is sort of fascinating. But, I mean, I would love, I would love, you know, just being in New York City some days, you sit in a park and you just wonder, like, why does this person carry themselves like that? What, what possessed them to dress up, you know, in this particular way on this, on this, on this day? There's curiosity and empathy. There's for curiosity you. and empathy there. It's like, why is this, this person leads from their hips? This person kind of, you know, what, has a weird posture. Like what, what's behind that? What are they trying to? And so, you know, especially in a city like New York, there's, uh, there's so many different kinds of individuals and so many different kinds of people and people expressing whatever their individuality is. And it's actually a great place to go to see people who just have an, an, an I don't care attitude. Mm. And to the extent where people 
people see so much individuality that they they, they begin to tune it out because yeah. there, there's just so much of it around. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. If you if you see the person who is like you know um, wearing you know wearing a plastic bag for hair <laughs> and uh, maybe talking to themselves, um, you know they, they might not be the person you want to uh, be close to. But mm-hmm. um, but I think the broader answer is that. Um, one, it makes life more interesting because people have a capacity to be very profoundly interesting. Um, I guess the caveat I would add is that, you know, it also helps to have parameters. I know, I know we're talking about, we talked about control, but in terms of existing in a society and a culture and a coexisting, there have to be some rules within which we operate um, in which people can, you know, feel safe and comfortable. So I guess that's the balance. The balance as well. You're not going around killing people, obviously. Well, you uh, know that those that's important in art too. Just to draw that parallel, right, art right. is not boundless everythingness. Art is best when it's a balance between some sort of limitations, whether self-imposed or simply the medium itself, and what you do within those limitations. Within those, within those. Confines. Same thing for society. Right. 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 So. I think that the more connected we become to all these things, the less scary all the dark stuff becomes. I think there's a there's mm. a there's a comfort that we can all take, you know. I mean, because what do people often say when they share their their sorrows, their despair, whatever's going on? Um, people inevitably say, you know, I I I know what you've been through. I've been there too. Mm. You're not alone. Um, I did a um, I wrote a largely uh, largely um, autobiographical um, solo piece uh, my last year of conservatory, and you know I'm just some random military brat and talking about alienation and disconnection and all these other things that had happened to me as a, as a child. But I had so many people who came up to me afterwards and were saying like, "I I know how, how you felt there. This happened to me." It, so people are are experiencing these things through their own sort of personal lens, and I think what it does is that it. it at a time when we talk about how divided we are, and there's so much, um, there's so much friction and tension, mm-hmm. and we focus on what our differences are and all the all the things about us that that make us different in our in our hunt for quote unquote diversity, superficial diversity, mm-hmm. shallow diversity. Um, what unites us is these these um, experiences of like you know it's it's okay like I I struggle I suffer I make mistakes um, I. You know, I, I'm miserable some days. Um, other days, I feel good. Sometimes, I I don't follow, uh, you know, the disciplines I've set out for myself. Mm-hmm. Some, you know, I, sometimes I scream at my kids. Sometimes I, you know, I, I do petty stuff to my to my spouse or partner. You know, I I, I react a certain way. Like we all have these flaws, and I so. think the more disconnected we are from we get from that, the more we we fail to understand ourselves and the more that we fail to understand ourselves, I guess the the irony is that the the more we fail to understand other people and that yes. creates the divide. So you have an increasingly atomized society. Um, so I guess the, the broader answer, the simplest answer is that, um, you know, within set of set of parameters, the more that we're able to wrestle with and grapple with and even embrace and integrate these parts of ourselves, um, the better for society as a whole, because it, it leaves us more, it makes us more connected, uh, more curious, I should say, more yes. curious, yes. more open. More human. And more human. That's and, what it is. Um, that's We're what all it the is. sad clowns. We're all, <laughs> you need <laughs> nice to drop the back. facade so that it yeah. actually becomes funny instead of terrifying and heated and divisive. And I'll say another thing too about that is that we, we learned to laugh we didn't learn to laugh at suffering, but we there there was a level of because once once you know it was over, the exercise was done. Mm. You were still okay, yeah. and you made it. And it's not that people should go home and like you know induce all kinds of you know emotions <laughs> in themselves and try to. But there is something to be said about like okay, I went through this experience. I did so very publicly, you know, albeit among you know peers that I trust, but. I had this experience, and now we're all sitting around having lunch, yeah. and it's okay. And everyone's so focused on their own problems that yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. not as worried about how I just crashed and burned, you know. <laughs> in the clown and, circle, in, in, yeah. in the clown circle. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's um, Man. Y- you, you survive, and you live, and you move on to whatever the next thing is. 
I'm, society is just a big clown circle. <laughs> and we all kind of need to just let it drop, let the facade drop just a little bit so that we can connect on this real level. Because that individual expression, your individuality actually helps me right. to become more of myself. Right. Yeah. Because then I can see more of myself in you because you're not projecting this idea of what you should be back outwards. You're real. And that realness, that's what we're all seeking. That's that, I know what you mean. Even though I didn't have that particular experience, mm -hmm. you're being real about it. And in that, I can find what resonates with my real experience too. I mean, that's the beauty of dropping that facade. So I think we should sum it up right there. Society is just a big clown circle. And it's all <laughs> time that we take our turn letting the facade drop just a little bit. And daring to be individual enough so that another person can find themselves in us. And through that is where we can connect and unify and bring things to a more human level instead of this, this tense, fearful, rageful environment that we're creating where we're all kind of hiding ourselves behind these ideas of what we think we should be or what's allowed, which is a losing game. You will never fully live up to what you should be or what's allowed because that is always changing. But you are always changing, and that's the more interesting journey to take because it is the real one. And as so, scary as it may be, yeah. it's, it's everyone's going through the same thing, yeah. and it's completely natural, and that's okay, and you're going to be okay. You specifically are going to be okay. Me, on the other hand, I don't know. <laughs> To, to be seen, part two. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation and for telling me about the clown circle because that has become the new metaphor for how I'm going to un understand life. Yeah, just get yourself a big red nose and put it on. and uh, I'll be fitting in a lot, you know. I can maybe have a guest role in CNN with my clown nose. <laughs> no, they're firing clowns this, these days, oh. apparently. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> we got to throw a, You know we got to end it with a few zingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think their, their biggest clown got uh, got the axe just a couple of weeks ago, so. Mm, so get in, the, get in the real clown circle, not the fake one. That's the moral of the story. Exactly. You know, build your own clown circle. If you take nothing away from anything that we've said, nothing else away, build your own clown circle. I love that. <laughs> I wander within myself, a tangle of flaws, a collection of futures. How can you know who I should be, with dishonest eyes blinded by intensity, the fog of fear obscuring you and me? The sun doesn't fight the rain, the moon doesn't fight the day. I refuse to smother my spirit to save your ego from decay. Who will know me if not me? Conformity is a body bag for who you could be. Something soft within you rots. A stench, your sacrifice to an insatiable mob. You expect strangers to save your soul with their promises of sugar-sweet society, but won't face the struggle required to become the you that you could be. My being is mine. Let me have the space and time to dig and fall, to spiral and crawl. Face yourself instead of chasing my flaws. Every human is a cracked mirror reflecting part of your reality. Fight and curse the reflection, but what exists persists, whether or not you choose to see. I'm not afraid to stumble under spotlight. What's true becomes more true despite all you might do to fight. But I too will fight. I'll dig and fall. I'll climb and claw, howling an ancient song that rattles thrones. Your eyes are too blind to this road. Trees and seas parting for me alone. Alone. Someday seen only by sun and black sky the cost of finding what only you can own. For the lonely, for the maligned, 
Savor those reminders of living, lest you cower in the corner, fading. As I wander into the depths of myself, my being becomes mine. Moored on the sands of a shallow self, many condemn the search for what they cannot find. To choose honesty and liberty is to brave the outrage of those who chose falsity and misery. Feigned perfection, weaponized rejection, entire generations playing pretend. Without the right to wander through light and dark, there's nothing else left to defend. <laughs>